In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Okay, well, hello, Sublation Media viewers and uh, listeners and readers. It's just me right now, Douglas Lane. Ashley is running behind schedule. She had a parenting issue, um, but I thought I would go ahead and start the stream. Um, right before I began, uh, I was looking at Twitter, and I thought I would uh, talk about Sam Cedar for a little bit before we jumped into the Marxism, which is promised in the thumbnail. Uh, and that will start up once Ashley gets here. Uh-oh. As, as, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm watching people tune out because where's Ashley, they're saying. Well, she'll be here in any minute. Um, but uh, I just wanted to complain about Sam Cedar. Now, here's the tweet I'm going to read you guys. Uh, Sam tweets, the flamboyant claim that my tiny YouTube show... Oh, wait, let me let me go to the actual quote. It starts with Glenn Greenwald. And Glenn Greenwald says, The reason the squad and House progressives never defy Pelosi or anyone else is because they have a pathetic partisan media, the Young Turks and Sam Cedar, who defend their harmlessness and venerate partisan subservience. So... Sam Cedar responds, he says, the flamboyant claim that my tiny YouTube show has the vast power to make national elected figures feel completely shielded from large swaths of public opinion is flattering, but probably a function of a brain hemorrhage or a recently minted massive hack with a gullible audience. So now I thought about this, yeah, maybe for about 10 seconds, and, and one thing jumped out at me about Sam's response, and I tweeted it, uh, my thought to him, and uh, this is what I said. I said, so you don't have an issue with his characterization of what you do, but just with his claim that you are significant. Um, so uh, I, I just thought I'd, I'd uh, you know, point out the fact, I mean, this is my Jimmy Dore moment, maybe, but that Sam admits that um, he is uh, creating harmless, venerate, partisan subservience on his show. Oh, but um, he will not uh, uh, take any credit for having any political influence. Now, with that out of the way, here is Ashley Frawley. Um, I had my unnecessary attack on Sam Cedar uh, put out there. Ashley, how you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I was just comforted with crying child. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so I, uh, you you will take none of the blame for what I just did, uh, which was uh, made a, a swipe at Sam Cedar at the beginning of the show for, for no real reason, except it was uh, flashed across my screen by the algorithm. Um, you, if you want to hear what I was talking about, I, I can fill you in after the uh, after the actual stream here. Oh, you're, you're, you're breaking yeah. up a little well, bit. Okay. You know, I have learned over the years to watch myself mm -hmm. back. I found it very hard always at the beginning <laughs> to listen, you know, your own voice recorded. So I do actually watch things back and correct my horrible mistakes. Um, so I'll see it when we, when I do that. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So this week um, we're going to be talking about the Grandris, um, Karl Marx, whether or not Marx has any, Thing to offer the left today, uh, I guess, whether or not the left has any capacity to to pick up on what Marx was about, and what Marxism actually is, or what Marx's theories were. Um, and this is coming out of the fact that you and I are together, and yesterday, just you, are leading a, a workshop on the Grandris, right? That's right, so, yep. Mm -hmm. So do you want to start by discussing how that went yesterday and, and what you're getting out of reading the Grundrisse? Yes, yeah, so I started reading the Grundrisse about, oh boy, um, 2019, I think. Um, I had always, I had read bits and pieces of it um, when I was doing my PhD, I think, and when I was writing various things. Um, so I had read like Notebook 7, um, you know, as a lot of people have. Um, so it was really good, you know, a few years back to really try to go through it. Um, and it took me about 
two years. Um, and that's partially because obviously I wasn't teaching about it and I was just reading little bits every night. But the way that I read is I can, I'm like, someone said to me like, there it is. Uh, while I was reading, Ashley, you're not reading. You're supposed to be, don't you have a reading group tomorrow? Why are you writing? Because I write, like all of my books are utterly destroyed. And that's my advice to anyone watching. Never just read and highlight. You are lying to yourself. Because <laughs> when you just highlight something, you're like, I know that. I understand that. No, if you can't cover the page and explain it back to yourself, you don't really understand it. If you can't write a little note in the margin, like summarizing the meaning in your mm -hmm. own you don't really understand it. So if you ever see me on a train reading, I look like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care what I look like um, because, I, you know, I feel like it's a waste of time. So it really took a long time for me to, um, to get through it. Um, and so now going back to it in detail has been so rewarding because I'm finding things that I didn't see the first time, reading through my notes and seeing that I maybe I didn't quite understand, you know, that little bit because of what came later because the Grindrisa is obviously Marx's notebooks um, that really he began compiling in 1850 but wrote in a fervor um, between 1857 and 1858 and they are just all over the place there are things that he talks about in one place that he then talks about later um, and you don't really understand it I think um, we have a few people in the reading group who haven't read Capital um, and I think that's a little bit difficult, especially if you read the Grindr soap, because you sit there thinking like, oh, my God, what is he on about? And then you realize, oh, this is, he's just saying that profit cannot come from circulation, because at that time, people were sort of trying to figure out the mystery of profit. And there were arguments about profit coming from circulation. That is when you sell the commodity, that's where the origin of profit is. That is not it. It's the re that's where you realize surplus value or profit, which is not exactly the same thing, but let's just say it is at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. That's where it's realized, but that is not where it actually comes from. And he's trying to unravel the mystery of where it, uh, the actual origin of surplus value it can't come from cost of production, has to come some, from somewhere. And if you don't know that, <laughs> it's really quite difficult because you're sort of reading, 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 and you go, oh, this is what he's, he's trying to explain. Mm -hmm. So I found that really interesting and getting some of the different points of view from the different people in the group has been really enlightening because um, some people will take a really formalist, not they won't take that approach, but they will kind of have something to say about the formal um, structure of the text, which I found really interesting. Um, people bring in a kind of uh, Lacanian interpretation. I know um, who does that. We just had him on uh, the, the podcast on Diet Soap. Thomas Jones is a, yeah, a, yeah. part of the, the group. Yeah. So I, I found that really interesting because I was trying to explain like um, objectification as a material thing, like the subject, your subjectivity, your creativity, your energy, your vitality is objectified in an object. And we had a really good discussion about different meanings of um, subjectivity and objectification. <laughs> so that was really cool. Um, so yeah, and there were a few things that came out in the discussion that I thought, you know, um, this is really missing on the left, um, which is, for example, and I think maybe we can, this can be the focus of our discussion as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that are in the Grindrisa or in Marx's work more generally that are missing from left-wing politics. Um, I think. Um, and one of those was uh, just a really basic kind of relational definition of something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's there's a bit that I I tried to do an impression of, of Jordan Peterson in, in the workshop, mm -hmm. but I can't do a Kermit the Frog. So I was like, oh, I can't do it. It's like, well, um, Mark, this thing that... <laughs> mm -hmm. That capitalists are all immoral. Right. <laughs> the workers are all moral. And I was like, okay, there's a bit in the Grindry so that, that really relates to this. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe, Doug, can you help me out? Why is that wrong? <laughs> Why is that? Uh, well, um, I don't I, know I don't which part like, of the Grin yeah. Grindry you you're out there thinking about, thing. but um, I know why it's, it's wrong. Well, you know, I, I'm going to uh, answer this by uh, letting you know that before the stream, I read... Um, some Pastone. He wrote an essay called Rethinking Capital in Light of the Grundrisse. Um, mm -hmm. And his 
main point is that um, Marx was not critiquing uh, capitalism from the standpoint of labor, meaning he wasn't taking the working class as the subject um, which could, uh, as it was, overcome capitalism, but was instead critiquing um, the mediation of society through labor or labor time. That, that's how I'll summarize it. it he's, what he said was a little different than that. Um, so under capitalism, the working class and and the work the work they do in, in production is what mediates society. It's what creates capital and capitalism or and the and the capitalist class really, and uh, therefore, um, you know, to claim that Marx was. Uh, valorizing the mor moral standing of the uh, oppressed, downtrodden workers, as a, as opposed to the elite capitalists, um, is entirely the miss the point, especially from the perspective of, of a particular reading of the Grundrisse, where it, it, this is a critique of um, labor and labor time as a mediating force in society, rather than a critique of the oppression from elite capitalists. Um, on some moral uh, or ethical basis. Yeah, so there are lots of ways, obviously, in which that line is wrong, in which Jordan right. Peterson is making a mistake when he thinks that Marx is making a moral critique of workers or a moral justification of worker control and capitalist exploitation or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps I've mischaracterized his argument, but in general- No, you have not. That is his <laughs> argument. That is poor, that is Jordan Peterson's understanding of Marxism, and it is yeah, and it's based um, on reading the, the Communist Manifesto twice. Um, in any case, skimming it briefly and not really right. understanding it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and it's a little embarrassing because it's um, usually when you debate people on the internet, they have a better understanding than that. <laughs> um, but he's so confident, which is good. That's great. Anyways, um, so one of the, the first way in which it is uh, a mistake is that. The relation, the um, de definition of what a worker is and what a capitalist is are relational definitions. They're not um, attribute or trade approaches. And I think a lot of people will do this and they make this mistake a lot. Even I make this mistake sometimes and I have to remind myself. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So a, a, a relational approach means that something gains its definition by its relationship to something else. So um, the worker is a worker by um, within a context of being obviously everybody knows this being deprived of their means of subsistence through historic a historical process of permanent accumulation um, that now obviously this is it, we're talking in the abstract here particularly at present workers may be you know investing in things that sort of thing but in the like abstract, particularly in the 19th century, you have a worker who is deprived of their means of subsistence. The only thing that they have to sell is their ability to work. And because of this, they come into a relationship with a capitalist who, in order to maintain themselves as a capitalist, um, they must uh, exploit labor power. They're like, look, I have all of these means of production. I have all of these factories and instruments of production, and I've got all this cotton here. And I need you to come and make this, maintain the value, maintain the money that I have paid for it. I've already, so it's basically, oh, I'm getting too deeply into this now. Um, it's, I have bought all this dead labor, the work of, of human hands in the past, and it's going to lose its value if it just sits there and deteriorates. So I need you, human, living labor, to breathe life into it. Mm -hmm. um, so to, the capitalist, to maintain himself as a capitalist, must do that or else his machines will depreciate, he will lose the value of the things that he has bought. And the worker must do that because um, they need to survive to the next day. Um, so in this relationship, they enter into this relationship of self-interest, the worker for itself, <laughs> capitalist for itself. Neither of them wants to enter into, into, the, into this relationship. The capitalist sees outlay on worker as a diminution of his wealth, and the worker um, sees work as a diminution of his energies. Um, and something that he has to do in order to survive. But you come together and you, uh, through this relationship, you constitute yourself as a worker and as a capitalist. Um, and now a capitalist can lose their capital, can no longer be a capitalist and therefore have to go and become a worker. Um, and 
that means that they're not a capitalist anymore. Regardless of whatever they did, if they're no longer putting their capital into motion, into the production process, and they go and work for a wage, they're no longer a capitalist. There's nothing about the individual. You cannot define a capitalist as someone who has lots of money, wears a top hat and a cane, and like, <laughs> um, controls glo global processes, that sort of thing. That is an attribute or trait approach. That is defining something by the list of possession of a number of attributes, um, as opposed to a relational approach in which you um, have a particular relationship to workers, have a particular relationship to capital and the production process and so on. If you exit that relationship, you are no longer a capitalist. Now, that seems really, really obvious. Um, and it's the same thing for a worker. A worker is no longer a worker if they exit out of that process, if they um, you know, they could inherit, Marx talks about in the Grundrisse, so they could inherit a bunch of money or something, mm -hmm. um, and then begin to put that money into uh, motion. And as they do that, when they do that, they are a capitalist, but mm -hmm. when they stop doing that, they are stop, they stop being a capitalist. Um, and that's, I think just obvious. And I'm sorry if everybody thinks that this, I'm just stating the obvious, but you yeah, see someone, kind of Daniel, Daniel Jacob says critiquing Jordan Peterson is low hanging fruit, but I, I, I want to say that I want to point out to Daniel and to you that <clears throat> this idea of um, the revolutionary subject being a subject with the uh, a more ethical perspective, um, a, a more defensible way of life, um, uh, uh, someone who might be valorized by their oppression, so therefore, and kind of an innocent. <clears throat> Maybe people don't say this directly. Is the, what the you know is how they conceive of the working class, but it does, I think, truly inform the way the left operates today. That they operate on the basis of defending the more ethical subject against the exploiters, um, you know, looking for uh, the, the 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 good people to struggle with and for, um, and that's just not what class politics will be about just yeah. will not be about finding the good people in the system and defending their interests as they are. Um, exactly. And <clears throat> really sort of bringing up Peterson was just my way into explaining some basic concepts, because one thing that I have noticed just sort of reading through comments and, and engaging with people on our Patreon and that sort of thing is that people have different levels. They're at different places in their <laughs> intellectual progress. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's good to go back over the basics. But for people who don't know, it's good to give them the basics. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not intending like this devastating critique of Jordan Peterson. I'm explaining the basic kind of um, understanding of, of Marxism and certain concepts as relational. Um, but also, you see these misunderstandings in the public sphere or just in online debate all the time. So people will say, I'm working class, particularly in the UK, maybe only in the UK. And people will say, I'm working class because they possess a certain number of traits. Maybe they have a particular accent. Maybe their parents came from a particular place. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they have a certain income level. Um, and so they will say, I am working class because I have these particular characteristics. But if you are selling your labor power in exchange for a wage, you are working class. Um, and if you are creating a commodity that is sold for more than, you know, you're working a certain amount of time that is not paid, um, that is not represented <laughs> in your wage, then you are working class. Um, and that is the relational definition. You know, I, I'll give you another example of how um, it goes awry to focus on trying to find the good people to defend um, and how you can see it enacted in the way active people on the left and activists on the left uh, talk and how they think. Um, recently, I was I had a conversation about um, doing activism for people who are homeless, but the 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 uh, uh, <clears throat> word used was switched over to houseless instead, right? And the reason why you want to use the, the word houseless instead of homeless is that you want to dignify the, the, the subject, the people who are on the streets with having a home, with being complete and full subjects, to being having a way of life even <clears throat> that needs to be defended. Um, so they're not homeless. They, it's not that they don't have a place in the society. It's just that the streets aren't, you know, uh, d designed to give them all the dignity that they deserve. You know, they, they, the maybe 
the park benches have been removed and they don't have a place to lie down. That's, that's not, that's not, that doesn't give them much dignity. So if you, um, if you don't call them homeless, you don't have to look at the total situation, um, which is uh, humiliating and awful and which is a product of needing a re the reserve army of labor on hand um, to, to prop up a system that relies on uh, inequity, but instead you can think about this in terms of the people's moral dignity and, and their, and their um, deservedness. Um, and all of that is used to kind of cover up the systemic and deep problems in society that create these conditions. Um, Walter Ben Michaels talks about uh, how uh, for the most part, I mean, I think with the homeless versus houseless, uh, language uh, this might be an exception but for the most part people don't say oh yeah I came I come from uh, poverty and you should respect the culture of poverty right <laughs> that, that poverty is something you want to get away from um, uh, and uh, I think when it comes to being working class there's something similar that we should embrace about it which is that we don't want to create conditions where the working class can continue in better conditions, but rather we want to abolish the working class. We want to overcome exactly. middle class distinction. <clears throat> now, um, so this is the thing. So left, the left now often struggles for recognition as opposed to emancipation, which I think is one way that you could um, sort of solidify that argument. Um, and the thing is, I can understand where some of that is coming from. The issue is that it's being transformed into a project in itself an end in itself, instead of one thing in, as part of a, a broader struggle. So things like, you know, why would you want to recognize certain working class cultures and lifestyles? Well, for a long time, there were explanations of social problems based on cultural deprivation. This idea that people in the inner cities or people in particular areas, they didn't, they didn't have culture. Like, it was just like they didn't have it. <laughs> um, and of course, the, it wasn't just that they, they didn't have culture. They didn't have white middle class culture. And so they were like, oh, they're not talking properly. They're not doing these things. And so the, there was this idea is like, no, these people have culture. It's just a different kind of culture. Um, and what the problem there, though, was that these things, these explanations uh, and these differences between groups were used as explanations for social problems. And the argument was, no, that is not why we have social problems. It is not something within us. It's not our culture or our lack thereof. It's not our behaviors. It is the system itself. And I think what got lost a little bit was that, and it became recognition as an end in itself. And I make these arguments myself all the time where I'm, I'm trying to explain there are many different ways of parenting children all around the world, across cultures, throughout history. You would be shocked at the way that children are raised and they grow mm -hmm. up to be contributing members of their societies. Um, but differences in how parents raise their children have become mobilized in explanations of social problems. And through all kinds of kindly language where it's like, oh, they're just passing on these bad ideas, these bad behaviors and um, working class people are bad parents. Um, and yes, that's sometimes the case, as it is the case across cultures and time and social classes. But for the most part, that cannot explain why people find themselves in that social class again and again and again. That is the structure of capitalism that gets lost um, when you are pointing to differences. Um, and sometimes people will say it in a nice way. They'll be like, no, it's because of these differences um, in culture or with indigenous people because they have lost their culture. I mean, to go in and give it back to them and so on. It's very kindly. But what they're really saying is you have these problems because of your culture or lack thereof or because of these behaviors. Um, and so that's where the fight needs to be in recognizing that there are differences and saying, yes, there are differences between people. People are adapting to particular circumstances and they're not pathological for that reason. We must recognize that there are differences there and not um, attribute them causal power. I think that's what we need to say. When I say attribute causal power, I mean like it's not culture that causes social inequality. It is the structure of capitalism as itself. Yeah. I want to I want to <clears throat> throw up a comment on the screen that's to the side of what you're saying. I, I agree with what, what you just said, Ashley. Yeah. So I'm just saying like the struggle for recognition has a place. <laughs> it's just it shouldn't sure. be the end. But... Um, it says, uh, and here I thought Marx might disapprove of people planning a career on Wall Street. Turns out there is no moral judgment involved. What a relief. Um, yes, is, I'm um, glad that you've learned that. I, we've done our role. We've done our <laughs> no, role. no, no, Ashley. This is snarky. This is sarcastic. No, no, this oh, no. is this person is not being snarky at all. 
you should learn that. Marks so becoming a lo- no, no, look, I, so becoming a tobacco lobbyist is free from moral condemnation. Hooray! Let's all go out and get filthy rich. No moral judgment. Now you I'm would be an, if you have that opportunity. You would be fucking stupid to give it up on moral grounds. Okay, is, I don't think becoming a moral, a, I, it is not tobacco, moral to impoverish tobacco yourself in purpose. particular. Sorry, go ahead. Tobacco lobbyists in particular might be. You could see there'd be a more. Oh, did you say tobacco lobbyist? I yeah, thought it was tobacco. Uh, becoming a tobacco lobbyist. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah. the point well, is. Well, yeah, that, I guess like as a lobbyist, it's kind of different. But I was thinking like as a, a, a capitalist pan- planting tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that the, the point is that, um, that uh, from a Marxist perspective, overcoming capitalism and the critique of capital itself isn't a moral critique that doesn't mean there's no such thing as morality within Mm -hmm. capitalism Mm -hmm. okay it just means that so if you want if you don't if you want to not be a marxist if you're not interested in radical politics if you want to simply try to police um the conditions that are you can spend your time um making decisions around what kind of career i mean you have to be in a pretty cushy position to be able to have a, a list of career options and just judge them on their moral basis. Um, but people do that. And, you know, there are people, you know, which phone company should I go with? Well, with, how about the one that donates 10% to activist politics or something like that? Um, Can I just respond? Yeah. Not from a Marxist perspective. That's besides the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause from Marx, from a Marxist perspective, the point is to get at the foundation of society that sets up the entirety of, of the culture, the economy, the politics, and so on. I guess is, is there something else? Um, it, so that the, the the very network of relations change, so that what what kinds of moral questions arise are different. Um, and that's that's the point we're making. And so the critique of capitalism is not that oh the capitalists are bad people. Elon Musk is a jerk, but rather you know, the critique of Musk would be, uh, from a Marxist perspective, would be one, um, the focus on uh, the, the kind of tech advertising as, as major sources of profit in, a, in, a, in the United States, say, is a symptom of something going wrong in the economy. That'd be the first thing that you'd want to, I think, recognize is the way in which these empires are built on ficti- fictitious capital and and speculation, um, and two, that the um, concentration of, of capital in a few hands, um, you know, is a consequence of the kind of pro- form of production that we have, and that 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 if we want to overcome that concentration, which which does have a lot of uh, you know ill effects, we need to address the what's setting that up and creating those conditions, um, and you know, and then finally, if we want to critique. Elon Musk, from a Marxist perspective, we could point out that his techno utopianism will never be realized as long as capitalist production is uh, constrained, or, or as long as technological advance advancement is constrained by capitalist production. Um, that that so that would be. Uh, I'll stop. So there. I think this is a really um, key idea, and I'm I'm shocked that people in the comments are pushing back against it. I think this is just really basic so i may have to labor the point a little I, bit. no i don't think it's shocking at all and again that goes to uh, you know to kind of addressing daniel jacobs um it is not anyone's fault that we think in these terms not any one person's fault that we think in these terms this is how we are trained to think and if you enter the left you're most likely going to be entering the left because you have some uh maybe natural affinity for the downtrodden it's because you have you look at the world of within in, in, with all its inequality and think this can't this can't abide you can't no abide. you you should enter the left because you were a star trek fan and you were impatient well that is that i know that would be um i mean i don't know if i really want a world where uh, everything's made of construction paper and and we have to really <laughs> do more. but but um i get your point um I mean so, that is the opposite side of it, but we have we have left that that vision of progress and freedom by the wayside a, a while ago now. And yeah. certainly, if you're if you're younger, um, 
then you know you're you're not going to see modernity itself as having a lot of potential. There's this is romantic critique that's infected the the left. Yeah. So John Bunch is having an aneurysm in the comments. <laughs> that's a value judgment. So here's the thing. The intention of the critique is that it is not meant to be a moral critique. And this is what makes it really hard. I've done lots of reading groups in my time. I've done, you know, lots of, um, I used to sit a capital reading group uh, annually. Um, and this was the issue that a lot of people came up against, is that they were often expecting when Marx is describing something, I think there are two mistakes that people make. One, when Marx is describing something, they think he is prescribing something, which is a really deep misunderstanding. So I get this sometimes in essays from students where it'll be like, um, Marx thinks that the value of a product should be <laughs> how much labor has gone into it. No, he's saying that that is what uh, so the social mm -hmm. average of labor, socially necessary labor time that's reflected in the product is, is the value of the product. He's not saying it should. That's just he's saying that's how capitalism works. And the second mistake that people uh, make is that they think that he is making a critique. Uh, or he is making a critique, but they, they think that he's saying, and they shouldn't do that. Uh, and we should uh, and we should find some way now of exiting this one thing instead of seeing it as a totality. So it'll be like, um, so a question that I'll often get is something like, okay, so Marx says that the um, that the uh, labor is or sorry, uh, value is determined by a social average, but how could we have, you know, so many different people and so on. How can we recognize that difference as opposed to, you know, having everything lost in the social average? You know what I mean? So they want to kind of exit at that point. So wanting to kind of like recognize different people where ca capitalism is a conglomeration. It is like a, um, it is a social substance. That what is, do they mean by recognize? Uh, yeah, so I mean, this was a question that came up, a really good question that kind of um, solidified for me some of the issues here with um, how people often use Marx in the public sphere. Um, was um, so Marx is talking about how um, value is a social average of all the different labors of all the different workers, let's say in a particular shoe factor or something like that. Um, and money it could money is a conglomeration of all of this, all across the economy and so on, this sort of level of productivity. And this um, uh, participant said, well, but that's that's wrong. There, there's so many different kinds of people, you know, as a disability activist, um, I've really been trying to get people to recognize and I'm probably mischaracterizing her. Well, one of the things that they're assuming is that, first of all, that the that the only kind of value there is in the world is the kind of value that can make um, can support capital. Right. I mean, what we're talking about is not someone's moral worth or someone's uh you know value in an in a universal sense but rather how they participate within the economy and it's absolutely the case that you know if someone is physically disabled and therefore they work more slowly than someone else then they're going to be contributing value at a slower pace and you know they're probably not going to meet this they may not meet the socially necessary labor time metric in order to even be part of the economy um, but it's still it's still a useful thing to say because this is something that actually happens that um activists have campaigned for a recognition of different ways of working which have allowed people to come into the labor process who otherwise would have been excluded but doesn't that doesn't that count as just like necessary labor time doesn't that just count as like we need the equipment so that this person who has a say is disabled and their hands don't function as well as other people's um, can have tools in which which allow them to keep up with the demands of production. Isn't that what is being? Yeah, but I think probably it e even when there is a lower level of productivity and, and I can well imagine that the the richest capitalists or the the most secure organizations, let's say, um, will might even be totally on board for that and campaign for that for more uh, for like laws that say you must have a certain amount of this whatever in your workforce that may nonetheless amount in a certain amount of inefficiency or that is production below the socially necessary labor time, um, mm -hmm. but they're happy with that because they can still keep up and still sell knowing that their competitors can't. And right. so it could be a form of regulatory capture. But, for but none of that has any any bearing on what creates value and and you know how whether or not it comes from a social average or not, right? It, it no, of course does. not. So that's the thing is that you'll never you won't exit that relation. 
-hmm. right? But by but this is the thing. It was like people were like they want to stop there, and I think there's a certain amount of value, as I said, in stopping there and being like, oh, it's on social averages and so on. Well, we can kind of push. We need another word other than value. But <laughs> I, sorry, did I say the word value in a different no, way? No, you said I think there's a certain amount of value in. Oh this shoot! Approach. No, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's not your fault. This is Marx's fault. This is what Marx did to us. He couldn't have. He should have. Usefulness. Ah, you see. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's useful to go this way, and he could even have radical implications, right? If you mm -hmm. say we we demand uh, that workers be allowed to produce based on their own skills and their own thinking rather than uh, to, to try to match his, the social average. I mean, that would be a radical demand if it could be enacted, yeah. very radical. And it is, and it is, and, and, it, and it is absorbed into capitalism because of what I mentioned before, that it's, right. it well, just, they just, the richest oh. capitalists are able to lower slightly the socially necessary labor time, that becomes the new socially necessary labor time, um, or they're able to, you know, maybe even still um, produce at the socially necessary labor time in spite of that. I'm not sure how it would work out. I mean, but anyways, knowing that their competitors will, can't. Capitalists will hire workers when they don't have any real work for them to do in order just to have them on hand for when they need them to produce, right? Mm -hmm. I've worked in uh, companies where for a couple of months, we were really just sitting around on our hands as we were waiting for the, the cycle to turn over. But they didn't want to let us go because that would mean rehiring us or hiring new people and that was what they really didn't want to have to do in training them so that it was less expensive for the company to pay us to do nothing than it would be to let us go and then hire new people and train them so there's always inefficiencies um and you know there uh, yeah you have to relate to the state you have to relate to the community it it may be necessary to uh you know allow for inefficiencies in your in your work um i want to can i but throw no, what i wanted to say about that is that people want to stop there but marx keeps going he's not saying and value is determined by this social average therefore that's bad <laughs> you know it's part of a totality it's a step that he needs to understand in order to get to the end point so this is the thing people think that he's making a moral judgment I mean, he is to a certain extent but it's a bit like and I'm not defending this. I'm just saying this is how it is in capital. At this is the exact moment someone enters the garage. I don't know if anyone can hear that. <laughs> no. um, is that it's a bit like um, describing the movement of celestial bodies and saying that there are certain laws of motion here. And we can see that an impact is coming <laughs> because of this mathematical equation that we have made. Now, to anybody who has studied the social sciences in the past, like, I don't know, even 50 years, you will go, Ugh, because this is science and the search for laws and regularities in a social system. And we've kind of moved beyond that. And I'm sitting on my feet and it really hurts. Ow. <laughs> um, uh, and we've kind of moved beyond that, supposedly. Right. But this mm -hmm. is what Marx is doing. He's he is. It's not just a value judgment like, oh, we should organize things differently because of exploitation or whatever. It is that because of these laws of motion, we can see that there is something going on. We can explain a puzzle, at the, which, is, which was uh, current in political economy, two puzzles. One, what is the origin of profit? And two, why, is, why does the rate of profit seem to fall? leading to persistent crises and so on. So he, by uncovering these laws, this, this, like, th this exploitation, he is able to explain why there is a falling rate of profit and persistent and highly destructive crises. That is the point. Um, and yeah, you can make a value judgment that I don't think wars should happen regularly where we just blow everything up and kill a bunch of people. Yeah, okay, I think that's probably a value judgment. Like leave things as they are and we will probably blow up the fucking world. Yeah, okay, that's a value judgment, right? But the idea is it's the same thing like <laughs> the underlying idea is that, you know, we can do a lot of mathematics to figure out what, what if an asteroid is likely to hit us and that is a value judgment that we probably don't want an asteroid to hit us. And that's why we're trying to do all of this science. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like, well, we don't really want to have values in here. So let's let the asteroid hit us. Well, I want to go back to addressing John Milton Budge, because I think you just did very well. But I just want to underline the point that he's saying he claims that we're making a value judgment, that we're making a moral critique. And 
you know, there are some things that you have to hold with in order for Marx to make sense. And, and um, th there are some, m you know, moral positions that you have to take. And one of them is that um, you, th that you have to embrace the idea that uh, human beings uh, could develop into, uh, 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 we could be more free and more productive um, and and we that we could get out from under the kinds of contradictions that are arising under our current form of uh, production and and society. So you you have to want uh, for there to be the possibility of a better world in terms of the level of freedom, the level of uh, individuality, uh, the level of, uh, of of equality, not inequality, um, and uh, the, the the kind of development that that we could expect. Now, if you don't hold with those values, if you think this is the best of all possible worlds, and you want to just simply protect it, then yeah, Marxism isn't for you. Um, but uh, I think that then we could start to argue about what would be good evidence for the possibility that that change is possible. Has there been historically uh, moments where human humanity has overcome uh, it, the forms of society that it was living within and created uh, new forms of society that in some ways uh, actuate more freedom? Um, I think we could argue for that claim pretty easily uh maybe you know not i couldn't do it because speaking is suddenly difficult for me but i think it could be could be done um um so, so i think also anyone who's watching might remember <laughs> might remember this video call themselves marxists who don't seem to have read a great deal of of marx um and don't seem to be familiar with what somebody has just that. discovered it <laughs> And it's actually rather, uh, it, it comes up every now and then. So this is um, the tweet from February 9th, 2020. Before you refer yourself to uh, refer to yourself or other people as Marxists, please read what he wrote. Mm -hmm. And people really didn't like the fact that I have blue-green hair and look kind of youngish. And so they really like to come at me. And I'm just like, oh, hold my beer. <laughs> so, hello. Is that why they're coming at you, you think? Is because of your hair and, and, how, and how young you look? Yeah, because here's the thing. Rick Kuhn. In, a, in an interview with you, says the exact same words that I use in this video. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an uncommon thing to say, and it's this line here. Um, if you read the Communist Manifesto, it's like an ode to capitalism. And I want you to go and Google that, because you can find that line everywhere. I was not being particularly original in saying that. And there's a wonderful video of you interviewing Rick Kuhn, where he says the exact line, and not a single person picks it up. But when people look at this video, that's the first thing that they pick up. And it's and the mistake that people are making is that they don't understand sublation. That they so what do they what do they think that you what are they just saying? Oh, this is um, this young woman just wants to get rich or something or uh, yeah, which is <laughs> there's a lot I could do to get rich. Um, uh, actually, no. If I if I could do something to get rich, I'd probably have done it already. And I. <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, no, um, they think that I am a right winger. Um, and so they think that I've just like picked up the Communist Manifesto and pulled out a couple of lines. That's so funny. sad that, uh, you know, uh, well, first of all, I don't see how anyone could look at your hair and think you're a right winger. But secondly, um, Semi you know, if you're if you're an attractive young woman and, and you're on TV, you're automatically a conservative. Oh, it's, well, thank you, Doug. So no, um, <laughs> I think it's it's because of the I was so keen to stress. And I remember when I did this interview, the cameraman stopped and looked at me like he'd never heard this before. And the, the journalist turned around and said, can we do more? And he said, I could do this all day. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, he'd never heard that before. And that was my point was to, you're so used to hearing the doom and gloom coming from leftists that like, you know, this is all terrible and, and and everything is bad and so on. And you miss the progressive side of capitalism, which is so basic to understanding capitalism as a totality and in its contradictions. That capitalism is, and this again, you see this in the Grundrisse in notebook three, which we did this week, where he says capital capitalism will have lived out its historic role 
when the realm of needs and um, like what is determined by biology is tiny, when we spend a tiny amount of time reproducing that, and the rest of our needs are determined by history. And capitalism plays that role of creating these needs, these new needs. People go, oh, all these false needs. You don't really need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the capitalist will tell you, you don't really need that because I want to pay you as little as possible. But at the same time, capitalism produces or gives us the capacity to produce an amount of wealth and abundance unimaginable in the past. And then it mm -hmm. whacks your hand and says, you can't have that. How dare you? Mm -hmm. And workers are not stupid. They're like, well, yes, I can have that. I had it last week. And now you're saying I can't have it. I've lost my mm -hmm. job. Um, now there's a recession. Well, what happened? All the stuff you told me there was too much stuff. And, and now suddenly it's all disappeared. And I should expect less. And I should learn how to be frugal. No, there's plenty in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's capitalism plays this historic role when it gets us to that point where it takes very, very little label to, labor to reproduce our existence. And it ends its historical purpose when it holds us back from that. And it holds us back from that when it creates destructive crises that destroy that wealth and culture for no fucking reason. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. unbelievable. People don't have, let's say, bread to eat. Well, I mean, it, there like, is a reason. A bread factory. <laughs> but there is a reason why it does it. It just, um, it's just letting go of its whole reason to exist at that moment. But it, it's because you know capitalism functions through a contradiction. So. Um, the reason why it, it demands that we are frugal and at the, at the same time that it demands that we consume or that we are, uh, you know, very pr super productive um, is because of the way in which mediating society through labor time sets up these contradictions between, um, <clears throat> you know, well, between after fundamentally between abstract value and use value. But uh, but. Um, but even beyond that as well, I, I, which if I could, if I had all, all my notes, I should write down or make a video. It's like all of the contradictions within capitalism, starting from the most fundamental to the very last one, which would be this tweet from Sam Cedar. Um, but <laughs> anyhow, uh, I feel like maybe I, I threw you off track, but it, but it does have a reason. It's just not, it's not the reason of any person, right? It's the reason of the whole, system yeah and and this is the thing too this is one of the other points that i wanted to to bring up about the morality involved you can be a good person you can be a bad person you can be i always use this line you can be kind to your pets <laughs> good to your children but of necessity to be a capitalist means that you must exploit your workers that is you must and it doesn't mean you must treat them badly again exploitation in Marx is not a moral idea of like poor treatment. You can be treated, you can treat your workers really, really well. But the mystery of surplus value that Marx unveils is that there is a certain amount of time that the worker is not compensated for, in which they expend their lifeblood, their vitality, their creativity unpaid. And it, this is masked by the wage relation because you do sell your labor power at its value. You do sell it on the market at its value which masks, you are getting an equivalent, which masks a period in which you continue working beyond that to produce surplus value for the capitalist. And the capitalist must do that in order to continue as a capitalist, because you have to, you know, you have to pay your overheads, you have to pay other things that are involved, you know, you have to pay for the next round of, uh, of production. You have to put some of that money back into production to create new, um, means of production to hire new workers to, you know, capitalism presupposes itself at the end of the production process. It presupposes also a historical process in which people have been deprived of their means of subsistence and all of that. Um, but to survive as a capitalist, just based on like competition, that you aren't going to be alone in producing something. If you're making money, it's going to attract other people to that. You're going to need to reinvest to make production more efficient. Means of production have a tendency to devalue. Um, capitalism cannot survive without revolutionizing um, the means of production, without revolutionizing itself. Everything is constantly, you know, we, I was just talking yesterday about um, how people are in Ottawa. I'm in Canada still at the moment, last day here. Hmm. <laughs> people in Ottawa are like trying to force everybody to go back into the office because the local area is, um, uh, is suffering, which is a bad thing, of course. Um, and because they've got these 
all this infrastructure, all these offices that they're paying for. And they're like, hey, look, this is a sunk cost here. Um, we want you to use it. And people are like, OK, but like I'm working perfectly fine. You want me to come into an office so I can continue to work remotely with New York? Like what? Um, and the and the reason is because this is what capitalism does. It revolutionizes things. And then your old infrastructure is useless. This is just the way that it goes. So you have to always be reinvesting to keep up. So to continue it to make that's not the only reason, but to continue maintaining yourself as a capitalist, you must exploit your workers or you will go and become a worker yourself. It is not right. a moral thing. So I want to um, throw uh, another comment on from Sean Moon on the screen here and kind of as an addition to what we've been saying. So he says aspiring to become a capitalist is unethical. It is also counter-revolutionary. And I think there's something here, not about the ethics of it per se, but um, the way in which the, the concern about it being counter-revolutionary to aspire to become a capitalist um, is, I think, uh, has some merit. Um, and But here, here's why. So even from the point of view of, of a worker who wants to escape the conditions of exploitation and get... get um, wants to have more stability, wants to be able to realize his or her own uh, dreams um, and not, not work from someone else. Um, as it is right now, uh, those practical concerns of the worker uh, uh, can, can be addressed in a, a couple of different ways, one of which is just to try to be a better worker and get maybe get advancement or uh, make sure that the, your employer does well, therefore you'll do well. Um, the other is to uh, try to organize with other workers in order to make your demand, get your demands met so you can have more leisure time, you can have higher wages and so forth. And the third is to find a way to break off and become an entrepreneur, go into business for yourself. Um, and that happens fairly frequently, actually, more frequently than, especially in the United States, I think, than we might think. I'm not sure what to what extent... Um, Entrepreneurs truly come from uh, wage work, but I do know that there are a lot of entrepreneurs and small businesses, and there's <clears> a constant churn. Businesses are formed; they they last for a year or two, then they go under, and yeah. people are pushed back into the workforce. And then and it's happening actually work. a lot faster now than in right. The past. So when you say it's counter-revolutionary, what needs to be communicated is not that oh you're working against your your fellow man, but also just as significantly, you're not going to likely realize the, your ambition this way. The better option would be to organize for something new. The better option is to try to take a risk on changing something more fundamental than you know what, who's in charge, whether it's you or somebody else. Um, but that is a very tough sell when you have no working class movement at all and no party and no poli no no. Marxist politics. So. so my response to that, I, I recognize, I don't know, I have to, I, I am sympathetic to the the sentiment expressed in that comment. Um, mm -hmm. But my response, or my maybe my knee-jerk reaction is communism is not a lifestyle. It is not something that you enact in your everyday life um, to show what a good person you are. If you have the opportunity to become a capitalist and you forego that in order to become a worker, I would suspect that you're pretty stupid that you've made a very bad decision there. If if becoming a capitalist gave you the space to think and create, which is what, wor what workers want, they want what, I always use this line from James Connolly, what they'd command from birth, <laughs> which is like this security and freedom. That's what everybody wants. Um, to kind of like put yourself down into uh, a situation of precarity on moral grounds, I think is, okay, you can do that and maybe it will make you a good person. But in terms of the whole scheme of things, I don't think it has done very much in terms of progressing uh, the revolution. I don't know. I don't know. At the same time, like as a capitalist, your interests are going to change. Um, and therefore this can become counter-revolutionary. But I wonder, do you, does that commenter think that Marx playing the stock market was immoral? Because of course, famously Marx played the stock market. Um, and of course, famously, Engels himself funded Marx on the basis of his family's factory. Um, was it immoral for the for um, the Bolsheviks to rob banks to take money from American oil? Absolutely not. It's basically saying 
you can have your revolution, but I need you to do it with both hands tied behind your back. Could you do that, please? Because you're a bad person if you don't do that. No. If you want to have your revolution, you're going to have to fucking rob some banks, buddy. <laughs> like, you're going to have to take money mm. from dark places and you should not give a shit if you are serious about it. If you were not like, it, it, I always use this example and I, it's funny because my niece is reading this book at the moment and it's like a children's book, but I absolutely love it. Um, which is, you know, and I actually, I'm not even sure if it's the right book that I'm thinking about, but do you know in Huckleberry Finn where Tom and Huck are like digging Jim out with a spoon mm -hmm. and he's like, and, and he's like, like kids, like I'm going to die here. <laughs> and the kids are like, we'll dig him out with a spoon and we'll pass it on to our children and they'll pass it on to their children. <laughs> Freeing Jim will be like the project because for those children, it's just a game. It's not real mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy. But if you're like, if it's real for you and you want to emancipate and you want to get out of this and create a new world, you're going to bring a shovel, you're going to steal, <laughs> you're going to get whatever you can to get Jim out of there. But no, for us, we're like, we'll do it with a spoon. <laughs> like, right. Well, right. I mean, and, and, but part of the reason why you might dig with a spoon is that the, I mean, just, uh, you know, I'm not referring to the book here, but like the other reason why is because you feel like it's hopeless, that Jim will never get out, mm -hmm. that the, the hard, the, the ground is too hard. Um, and so it's a, becomes a symbolic uh, gesture to try to dig him out rather than something you think is, that can be done in a practical way. Um, and I think that is kind of what the left, maybe more than the working class is up against. I think the working class, uh, has thrown away their spoons. You know, <laughs> they're not they're not trying to dig up anything, for to a large extent. Um, and 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 unless they are, I mean, there are moments where they're organizing to, to improve their conditions, and that happens again and again all over the place. And and it's inspiring when it happens, and it's happening now. But as in in terms of a political project, that's what we do. We're uh, we're trying to get a bit of our social product back. Right, but in terms of a, a political project, there in, in certainly in the West and and I would even say around the world, there is no political project to overcome capitalism, um, in the way that Marx meant, um, you know that right now. And so around the world, I mean, yeah, I, I would say the entire in the entire world, Ashley, I would throw China into that mm -hmm. uh, under that. I would say. Um, and this, maybe we can talk about this in the parrot room, but this has to do with not having a different conception of what capitalism is and what's in the Grindrice. Mm -hmm. Having a different conception of what capitalism is about. Um, Based on what's in capital. Than, than what's in capital, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, I think this is true, by the way. Yeah, becoming capitalist willy-nilly, especially these days, is fantastical. That's right. And there's a wonderful line in a, a lecture that Andrew Kleiman gave like a million years ago, and I've never forgotten it. And it was something like, <clears throat> capitalism is even hurting the capitalists. <laughs> like, it is so long outlived its reign and its usefulness to humanity that it's even like hurting the capitalists. Like You can like, see it in Elon Musk. He's a, he's a man-child. <laughs> I don't mean psychologically. <laughs> I mean that even they are like you know struggling to maintain themselves as capitalists. Um, uh, well, yeah, and but yeah, it's, uh, my heart bleeds for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, someone says like, oh, so you would encourage people to go become capitalists? Well, I think the answer to that is, I mean, I w it is understandable to aspire to that within our present situation. Why would you not aspire to? riches and comfort like why would why would that not be an aspiration is it a good idea probably not because it is very difficult you and this is the problem of capitalism at the moment that it is um the uh, rationale for entering into production is dwindling so you can expect a far less secure and a far smaller rate of return um, and so money is getting pushed into all sorts of non-value producing things like rent, like copyright, like intellectual property, whatever, um, because and and like giving people debt um, because there are very few places or spaces for productive investment. And again, this is one of the things that people can learn from and why it's. You can easily get bogged down in these kinds of arguments, and everyone's like, "Ashley's a right winger." <laughs> <laughs> Look, and you're not. Uh, it, people uh, will go after me on that point as well, from time to time. <laughs> not just you, Ashley. Um, 
<laughs> John, but what, John, what, John. My point is, though, that I was trying to make is that this is the point of reading these things because you understand things as a totality that you don't get bogged down in these questions of like, is it moral for me to blah, blah, blah. It is a crisis is coming, a big one. It's here kind of a little bit and they're trying to draw it out for as long as possible. And crises are destructive AF and we have to figure out a way to avoid this entirely unnecessary destructiveness that comes with capitalism. We must move beyond it. It gives a sense of like, and, and this was the, the, the vigor that Marx was writing with in, in this time period, because since 1852, he and Engels had been predicting it that a crisis was coming and here it was on their doorstep. And the and Marx writes like every crisis is a punishment of the capitalist, uh, a punishment on the workers for failing to overcome capitalism. And he doesn't mean that like you fucking workers. He means like, look, this is going to keep happening and we are going to bear the brunt of it. I know our children are the ones who are going to go to war. Uh, you know, we are going to get fucking shot up and, and, and have our livelihoods taken away from us. Like we it is there is an urgency here. That I, that's just why I kind of like roll my eyes. Like, is it moral to do such and such? Is it blah, blah, blah? I'm like, the the the, the deluge <laughs> is coming. This is what Marx writes to Engels in a letter in 1857, when he, or was it 1857? December of 1857, um, when he was writing the third notebook. He was like, I am writing as fast as I can before the deluge. But like, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite serious, you know? And people go, well, oh, well, things carry on afterward. Yes, but how many million people dead in, the, in, in its wake? Well, in the parent room, we should talk about whether or not we need the concept of a terminal crisis in order to have a radical politics um, mm -hmm. and just what it means to be writing before the deluge um, uh, and to, to and maybe talk. I, a I don't bit care about whether or not we need it. We have it. <laughs> well, all right. Well, that's another question we can we can ask, too. But I, but because um, I'm not I'm not. Andrew Kleiman disagrees with Grossman on the question of whether there's a terminal crisis coming. And I want to right. know. Right. Like, okay. And I'm not sure how I feel about a terminal crisis. I don't yeah. think that there will be an absolute breakdown. Um, and I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I know Grossman says that it's the ultimate breakdown. But I feel like, yeah, I mean, we could have a nuclear war and people could be selling fried cockroaches at the end of it. Like, <laughs> we, well, I mean, we could have a nuclear war especially you know let's let's see what happens no we could have a nuclear war and if it's uh small scale there might be large pockets where the old economy was still somewhat functional you know yeah. but i mean if we have a full-scale nuclear war though i don't know you know selling cockroaches strike cockroaches i don't think that will maintain or well i'm going to tell you in the, <laughs> in the ferret room a ridiculous story about this remind me as soon as we get in it's a dream that I had because I'm Ojibwe, right? And dreams matter to us. So fuck mm -hmm. you if you think that. No, no, no. I want to hear about your dreams. <laughs> I, 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 I think a detailed it's... dream of how it all works out. I think dreams, I don't think, <laughs> they're, well, you can tell me what how dreams matter to you in the <laughs> chat room. But um, what about uh, people, this is John Milton Bunch. He says, what about people who don't work and live off stocks and other investments? Well, they're financial capitalists or they're retired workers. Um, oh yeah, retirement as know? well comes from. That. Uh, so it's like it's you know these these, these are not moral exactly categories. Not a these, moral category. Right. So like you know how you survive. Um, it's it's not a moral category. It, 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 Look, if it, it worked for people in the Enlightenment, they could be like, "This idea came to me while in the bathtub." Then I can have. <laughs> Oh, look, look, save it. Save it for the parent room. We'll, I'm we'll joking, talk about dreams. by the way. I'm not. I don't know. Please don't think that. Uh, I, I do. I am actually interested in, in, in dreams in general. Um, so, yeah, let's let's uh, sign off here. We got about 100 people watching. Um, thank you all for for watching. Go to the parent room. Um, that's on uh, patreon.com backslash diet soap. If you've enjoyed this conversation, Click on the like button. That's uh, helps the algorithm understand that we're worth watching. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Come support us on Patreon. I think I said that. And answer Do the all question the down below: Is are the categories of capitalism essentially moral? Tell your conservative uncle he needs to get his act together and become a moral person and watch our channel. And uh, yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'm gonna end it there. Uh, let's see, where's the little button I'm supposed to press? In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people